Uh, welcome uh, to another session of the West Talks. Um, today we have Dr. Bill Mitt joining us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We know you're a very busy man. Um, firstly, the West Talks is organized uh, in collaboration with IC Impacts and UBC Future Waters. Um, IC Impacts is, is the Canada India Research Center for Excellence, um, with, with international collaboration between Canada and India. And UBC Future Waters is a recent initiative at UBC to focus on interdisciplinary water research. This is the organizing committee since um, its very inception in the month of July. We have um, myself, Abhishek, Jaskaran, Fuhar, and Carl, uh, who are graduate students at UBC and McGill. And we also have Feria, who's the, whose uh, emails you have been receiving over the last few months, and she's the IC Impacts event coordinator. Uh, this is the list of talks we've had so far. Um, happy to announce that we have talks as assigned till December 5th. Uh, today we have Dr. William Mitch from Stanford University. Before I introduce the speaker today, um, just to let you know that we have a list of our past um, um, talks recorded on our YouTube channel on IC Impact. So if you've missed the previous talks, you can tune in there to see the previous um, lectures. And I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, um, uh, Dr. William Mitch, or Bill Mitch, as he is uh, known, as uh, is going to talk about which disinfection byproducts matter for portable use, reuse. Um, Dr. Bill Mitch is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford. He has studied disinfection byproduct formation mechanisms over the past 20 years, uh, with a particular focus on nitrosamines. His research has evaluated techniques to minimize the formation of disinfection byproducts. He obtained a bachelor's in archaeology from um, Harvard University and uh, his master's in science and PhD degrees in civil and environmental engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. He received the 2004 Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award from the Association of uh, Environmental Engineering and Science Professors and Parsons Engineering and the NSF Career Award in 2007. He served as the chair of the 2017 Disinfection Byproducts Gordon Conference as well. He served at, uh, on an ND, NWRI expert panel evaluating mixing of portable reuse discharges into the reservoir feeding the last version is Tryon for drinking water plant. Uh, to top it all off, he also holds a P license in California. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bill Mitch now um, to take it over um, if you want to share your screen. Great. Thank you. Let me just get the screen sharing sorted out here. All right. Oops. Sorry about that. Wrong one. And great. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation to Fuhar and uh, thank the rest of you for showing up to the presentation. Uh, it's too bad I couldn't come up there. Actually, I was uh, up there about two years ago for vacation. And since your campus is so nice, uh, we went through the campus and actually went and found your building. But since it was the summer, there weren't uh, too many people around. But I'm hoping to eventually get back up there again. I might be back up there in March because I'm giving a talk to the UBC chemistry department. Uh, but we'll see if that actually plays out as a physical appearance or more of a remote one again. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today was potable reuse. And uh, let's see, move on here. Uh, one of the first uh, things to discuss is why would we do such a thing? It might seem somewhat bizarre, particularly for you who are up in the wetter portions of the world. Uh, but this, I'm showing a, several figures from a National uh, Research Council report, sort of an arm of our National Academy of Engineering. And uh, what we're showing here in the lower left is total U.S. reservoir storage over uh, the past century. And what you can see is that it ramped up rapidly and then leveled out. And uh, leveled out mostly because most of the uh, useful rivers have already been dammed. So imported water is going to become uh, increasingly difficult to capture. If shown in the middle here is U.S. population growth for several states and then the US average. And what you can see is that many of the states that outpace the US average are in the desert areas. Nevada, Arizona, Texas, California, and even Florida is relatively dry, relative at least to its population. 
And then over on the right is a projection of what's going to happen with future climate change, where pink indicates uh, less rainfall, blue indicates more rainfall. And what you can see is that the pink areas are precisely these states, including if you look at southern Florida, it's also in the pink zone. So water is going to become increasingly scarce precisely where people are living and imported water is, is going to be less and less of an option. And so what are the options? So as just mentioned, imported water is already essentially tapped out. Uh, one item that captures the public imagination, at least, is seawater desalination, but the salinity of seawater is so high that it's the most energy intensive option. So it is considered by municipalities, but usually as a last resort. Plus, the fraction of water that you recover for each gallon going in is uh, relatively small, again, due to the high salinity. So what most cities are looking at are items like capturing urban stormwater and converting it into a drinking water supply, uh, maybe looking at brackish groundwater desalination, whereas uh, because the uh, salinity is lower than seawater, it's cheaper to recover the water and you get a higher recovery. But the one we want to talk about today is wastewater recycling. And part of the attraction is it's a local supply of water, so you control it. You don't have to fight with other municipalities to pipe their rivers down to your location. And the flows uh, approximately match what you need. What goes in goes out for the most part. Uh, an indication of the interest in this is uh, LA, Los Angeles has uh, issued an order to recycle 100% of their wastewater. Uh, what they're calling their local green new deal. So these are kind of the low energy options that uh, municipalities are focusing on as opposed to seawater desalination. So with respect to uh, wastewater reuse, how do we do it? Uh, the, the challenge is that there are thousands of chemicals used in your consumer products and also by industry that are gonna wash down in the sewer and enter our sewer shed, which will end up being our water supply. And so this is the challenge. What, what do we do to make sure that the chemicals are no longer in there? And the problem is we can't possibly measure them all. There's too many of them. So instead, what people look at is the multiple barrier approach. So applying different treatment barriers to ensure rejection of a broad range of chemicals. And so the standard uh, technique used in, at least in California, is this uh, what's called a full advanced treatment training. Starts with microfiltration. So you take your conventional secondary affluent, run it through a microfilter, which really just is a pretreatment for the heart of the process further downstream. It removes particles. It's a glorified sand filter in a sense. Uh, the heart of the process starts with reverse osmosis, where it's essentially a broad screen physical removal technique. The idea is that ideally, the only thing that the pore sizes are so small that ideally all that makes it through the membrane is water, which is almost true. But the problem is when you have low molecular weight and particularly neutral molecules, uh, they can often slip through the process. And uh, in, in fact, one of the uh, classes of chemicals that have these characteristics are disinfection byproducts. Uh, so we know that certain chemicals slip through the RO membrane. And so uh, the second stage of the process is an advanced oxidation process, so sort of a broad screen chemical removal barrier. And typically they operate by shining UV light on hydrogen peroxide to generate hydroxyl radicals. The idea is that hydroxyl rad radicals are, uh, react rapidly and non-selectively. So ideally whatever slips through the membrane can get taken out by these uh, radicals. The challenge again is that halogenated molecules are electron withdrawing. So they react relatively slowly compared to other chemicals. And disinfection byproducts are again, are halogenated. So they tend to be challenging molecules for these treatment trains. So why focus on disinfection byproducts? So again, the, our uh, arm of the National Academy has written a report on potable uh, reuse. And they've looked at various different scenarios. And they've looked at different classes of chemicals of potential concern. So disinfection byproducts, including nitrosamines, but also things that the public cares about, like pharmaceuticals. And what we see here are margins of safety calculations. So if you look at the concentrations you find in wastewater reuse under different scenarios, and you weight them by metrics of toxic potency, 
uh, you've come up with these numbers and these are on a margins of safety basis. So a high number means you're nowhere near a level of uh, concern for public health. And so we see is that for pharmaceuticals, you're in the millions. So these chemicals are nowhere near concentrations that, that uh, cause a health threat, whereas your disinfection byproducts and particularly nitrosamines are at much lower levels that could be a potential concern. Why else to focus on them? Uh, they are regulated in drinking water. So we have maximum contaminant levels on trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids. Certain states, such as California, where potable reuse is uh, practiced widely, uh, have notification levels for NDMA, this chemical up here. Pharmaceuticals, there are no regulations. Uh, they're, they're a public relations concern, not a regulatory concern. Uh, the other issue here is that uh, disinfection byproducts actually form within the potable reuse stream. So here again is our standard microfiltration reverse osmosis advanced oxidation process, but we're applying disinfectants, typically chloramines, upstream of the membrane processes to control biofouling. And then we also apply chloramines at the end of the process to leave a residual through the distribution system. So we can continue to form these byproducts through the treatment train. Whereas most other chemicals are, such as pharmaceuticals, are challenges in source waters. And if we're not forming them in the process, we have the entire treatment train to try to remove them. So since we have the potential to form these during the reuse process, the name of the game becomes how do we prevent their formation? because we need the disinfectants both to disinfect the water, but also for other operational purposes, such as biofouling control. So I wanted to give you an example of uh, some of the things we do, which is to try to figure out how various chemicals form uh, so that then we can tweak the disinfection process to try to prevent their formation. So as an example, I'll give you uh, NDMA, again, this chemical up here, and I won't go through how we figured out this mechanism, but we did a bunch of work to try to figure out that this chemical really forms from an inorganic chloramine species called dichloramine. It tends to be a minor species. Usually when you're chloraminating, your chlor the main species is monochloramine, but there's an equilibrium with dichloramine. There's always low levels, 5% or less of this guy. And what we figured out is that this guy is essentially solely responsible for NDMA formation. So it reacts with amines. What we're showing here is uh, dimethylamine, or what we call the unprotonated form, so above its pKa, uh, reacts to form a hydrazine intermediate, and then there's a branching pathway where it can form various products or in relatively low yield react to dissolved oxygen to form NDMA. But the key for what I was going to show hereafter is that uh, it's really this minor species that we need to worry about. If we can, we want to use chloramines for various purposes. We want to control biofouling, for example, on RO membranes. The name of the game is how do we use that, uh, but direct it towards monochloramine rather than this guy. So one of the things we looked at is when you make chloramines, typically what you add is chlorine and ammonia to form monochloramine. Again, your predominant species at about a one to one molar ratio, a little bit higher excess of ammonia, but about a one to one ratio. So you should get mostly this guy, but there are these equilibrium reactions. So you will get some of this. And so one of the things we were looking at is that in some potable reuse trains, you have ammonia in the wastewater. When you inject chlorine, you're injecting a really concentrated stock, essentially a bleach bottle. And so you have this concentrated plume and these, uh, these Chloramine formation reactions were very fast, uh, time scales of a second or less. And so if this hasn't properly dispersed, you might favor, because you have a re at this point of injection, a relatively high chlorine to ammonia molar ratio, favor the formation of dichloramine. And so you go on to form NDMA. So one of the things we looked at was, what if you just split up, uh, add the same total mass of chlorine, but rather than adding it all in one location, split it up between several injection nozzles so that you can reduce the, uh, the intensity of the chlorine concentration. And so we did this at a pilot facility at a wastewater reuse plant where we evaluated NDMA formation after a 24-hour distribution system-like holding condition. 
for comparing a single injection nozzle or distributed between two injection nozzles. And just by splitting it up into two injection nozzles, nozzles we essentially cut the NDMA concentration in half. Um, so I wanted to give you a second example, and uh, hopefully this isn't too repetitive. I just saw in your intro that uh, Dan McCurry had uh, given a talk earlier. So this is based on a project he did as a PhD student. So I don't know if you talked about this, but uh, if not, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so again, here is a reaction where an equilibrium reaction where monochloramine can react with itself and uh, transfer over to dichloramine and ammonia. And so we have this equilibrium reaction. And one of the, th the odd things about uh, RO treatment is that we may favor the formation of uh, dichloramine and therefore NDMA due to the reuse strain. And so again, we apply chloramines upstream of the membrane processes to uh, control biophthalmic. So we're adding ammonia and chlorine. So we'll form some chloramines. Let's say that we did a good job and we have predominantly monochloramine. As we run it through the RO membrane, two things happen. RO preferentially rejects shard species, so our ammonium will get stripped out. We also are stripping out carbonates, which are negatively charged. We strip out the bases, that means that our proton concentration goes up. So our pH upstream of the membranes might be about 7. RO permeate is essentially deionized water, so it's about pH five and a half. So we're increasing the protons, we're decreasing the product by Le Chatelier's principle. And we're gonna shift the reaction to the right and, and convert monochloramine over to dichlor. So thinking a little bit further about this reuse train, we have pH five water. We typically go through the advanced oxidation process, and then we add lime at the end to boost the pH back up to near eight, so we don't degrade the concrete pipelines as we distribute the water. So one of the things we were thinking about here is that as we do this process, we run it through the RO membrane, we're gonna start converting over to dichloramine. The longer we wait, the more dichloramine we're gonna get. Then when we add the lime, we're gonna convert our uh, dimethylamine from the protonated state to the active deprotonated state because we've raised the pH. So now we have the two ingredients, the deprotonated dimethylamine and the dichloramine, and we'll go on to form NDMA. So one of the thoughts was, could we move this line injection port in front of the AOP process? So we minimize the time for this reaction to happen. We don't uh, allow time at the low pH conditions to accumulate dichloramine. We'll eventually have to add the lime someplace, and so we'll get the deprotonated dimethylamine, but at least we'll have minimized the other reagent. So Dan had done some kinetic modeling of what happens to the chloramine speciation. The longer you wait after RO before you uh, adjust the pH with the lime. And what you see is the dichloramine declines and you form, I mean the monochloramine declines in favor of dichloramine. And then he also modeled out for different time delays uh, until you add the line, how much NDMA you form. So the longer you wait, the more NDMA you form. So then we did some lab experiments with RO membrane coupons, where again, the longer you wait, the more NDMA you form. And we also went out to a full scale, uh, one of these treatment trains down in San Jose. And again, the longer you wait before you add the line, the more NDMA you form. So a simple piping change, again, in terms of where you add the line, might help you uh, remediate this problem. So uh, kind of migrating over to the second half of the talk, I wanted to recognize that uh, disinfection byproduct formation is a complex balancing act. First of all, we're balancing killing pathogens versus disinfection byproducts. The reason why we're adding the disinfectants is to guard against the acute risk of pathogen infection. But we realize there's a trade-off that you're adding something that's going to generate carcinogens, and so it's an optimization game. But even within the, uh, this category over here, we're balancing between different classes of disinfection byproducts. So I wanted to give another example of a pilot uh, process we looked at where a potable reuse plant was interested in applying free chlorine. So they had a fully nitrified effluent, no ammonia. So they had the opportunity to add free chlorine 
to get effective pathogen kill. Uh, but as you add the free chlorine, you start forming lots of halogenated byproducts, such as trihalomethanes. And so to shut down the continued formation of these trihalomethanes, you would inject ammonia and convert it over to chloramines, which minimizes continued formation of these guys, but then essentially slows down the pathogen kill and also then favors, because you have chloramines, the formation of NDMA. So how do you balance all these? So what we did was a pipeline pilot test where we looked at different free chlorine contact times before you add the ammonia. And what we see here with uh, MS2 uh, bacteriophage, it's a viral surrogate where the target for the regulators is five log inactivation, is you need very little free chlorine contact time, about three milligrams minutes per liter to get to that five log inactivation target. So uh, if we then think about the trade-offs with disinfection byproducts, what we're showing here in green is trihalomethanes, and in purple is the NDMA at the end of the process. So after the free chlorine exposure, followed by 24 hours of contact with chlorines. And so as you increase the free chlorine exposure, uh, that starts to deactivate the precursors for NDMA, but eventually you add the ammonia, you form the chloramines, and you see how much NDMA you form. So the greater the free chlorine exposure, we do decrease the NDMA formation, and we get back down towards the 10 nanogram per liter notification limit for NDMA. But the cost of that is the greater free chlorine contact time also boosts your trihalomethanes formation and gets you up near the drinking water MCL. So the challenge here is how do you thread the needle between all of these different competing challenges controlling NDMA trihalomethanes and pathogens. And uh, it comes back to the idea that overall it's an optimization game. So uh, this comes to sort of the second half, which is to say, how do we validate potable reuse trains? So uh, as I mentioned in California, the typical treatment train is this microfiltration, reverse osmosis, advanced oxidation process. Uh, it, works it's in some ways, but uh, there are, is some resistance to it because it's relatively high energy. And whatever is rejected by the membrane has to be discharged as a brine, and that can be problematic. So in other areas of the US, there is interest in alter alternative uh, to the multiple barrier approach, where we use ozone and biological activated carbon as the multiple barriers, followed by advanced oxidation. This is a lower energy process and it doesn't generate a brine, but there are concerns about whether it produces uh, sufficient quality of the water. So how do we go about uh, deciding whether that's the case or not? And so just if we take the conventional approach, which is to look for uh, levels of specific chemicals and NDMA again is the focus for potable reuse processes. We did a pilot study down in Los Angeles where we had side-by-side -side treatment trains. One treatment train, you take your secondary effluent, sand filter, it, tertiary uh, filter, go through the conventional California process, microfiltration, reverse osmosis. Side by side, we could also take that filtered effluent, treat it with ozone and biological activated carbon. And what we're showing here is NDMA concentration. So if you go through, uh, if we're looking at ozone, ozone reacts with precursors, makes some NDMA, but then biological activated carbon does a great job of reducing it. If you go through microfiltration, you're applying chloramine, so you can form some NDMA. RO removes some, but not all, because uh, NDMA is neutral and low molecular weight, so it goes through RO membrane. So overall, the ozone BAC system does a better job, and this might be a motivation to say, hey, maybe we should go switch this energy intensive process out for this, because it helps reduce one of our primary targets. But uh, is that really true? So um, as I mentioned, there's uh, interest in, in trying to develop a protocol to rate the quality of the potable reuse effluent. And what I hope to show is that the current regulatory approach is slow, piecemeal, and problematic. So is there a better way? And so I just want to kind of go through uh, how I see some of the problems with the current approach. So I didn't mention this before, but one of the criteria for California for potable reuse trains is they monitor bulk parameters such as total organic carbon, 
where the target is to reduce the total organic carbon to less than 0.5 milligrams per liter. And so there's some concerns about this. Does this really reflect what we're targeting, which are anthropogenic contaminants? Anthropogenic contaminants tend to be at trace concentrations, micrograms per liter or less, and they tend to be low molecular weight. So what really makes up total organic carbon are biopolymers and, and humic materials and that sort of thing. Does the behavior of total organic carbon really reflect the behavior of anthropogenic contaminants? And is this focus on total organic carbon, uh, does it have negative out uh, consequences for the treatment trains that we're pursuing? So uh, one of the primary drivers for reverse osmosis in California is that there's no way you can reach this 0.5 milligram per liter goal unless you use reverse osmosis. Ozone, BAC isn't gonna get you there, as I'll show you. And so by having this target, we're forcing RO, which in turn forces the use of high energy and concerns over brine disposal. What's another problem with the current approach? There's really no clear end game uh, or comparison uh, that we can point to when we rate potable reuse water. So there's, there are thousands of contaminants in sewage. We're never gonna be able to monitor them all, but we have fancier and fancier analytical equipment. And so every time a new chemical is discovered, uh, the public gets concerned. Oh, there's, there's a pharmaceutical in my water. Should I be worried about it? It's what the potable reuse uh, operators like to think of as the flavor of the month club. So, do we really need to care about those chemicals? Are they of health concern? How do we rate that? When do we consider the water safe? We can't possibly address all the chemicals. Which ones really matter? Another problem, uh, the current regulations focus on individual maximum contaminant levels for particular classes of contaminants, such as BVPs. And so we don't really recognize explicitly in the regulations, the concept of mixtures. And so just as kind of a thought experiment, uh, if we had a water that had 10 contaminants, each at 90% of their regulatory limits, the regulators would say that water is safe. Whereas if you had a water that only had one contaminant right at its maximum contaminant level, that would be considered unsafe. Does that really make sense? It would seem like actually this one, when you accumulate all the different uh, contaminants in there should be of lower quality. Uh, so why this is important is because when we choose a particular regulatory approach, we essentially direct the treatment process, the design of the treatment process. So I gave you this example before of uh, chlorine, chloramine disinfection of a tertiary effluent and the trade-offs are involved uh, that are involved here between trihalomethanes and NDMA. Depending on which one we choose to focus on, we would uh, choose a different outcome in terms of free chlorine exposure. So have we made the water safer overall or not if we focus on a particular chemical? Uh, another uh, issue here is it's unclear which compounds dominate the risk. So if we look at where the maximum contaminant levels are set, they're each set at different risk levels. So bromate has a 10 parts per billion or microgram per liter regulatory limit. If we figure out what the cancer risk is that's associated with that, it's two times 10 to the minus four. Whereas NDMA that has a 10 nanogram per liter notification level, that risk is down about an order of magnitude lower. So uh, essentially we're directing people to care more about NDMA than bromate. So this would uh, suggest that uh, sort of encourage people to switch over towards, for example, ozonation because bromate's of a lower concern. All right, um, and again, that can uh, have implications for how we choose different treatment processes. So uh, we came up with a, a kind of different framework, regulatory framework to rate the quality of effluents. And I kind of wanted to go through that here. The basic idea is that we need some baseline of comparison for uh, the qualities of different waters. So what we thought we should do is compare your potable reuse effluent to your local conventional drinking water. The idea is that uh, it's hard to ever in absolute terms say water is safe, but clearly people are already happy drinking their local conventional drinking water, even though we know there are contaminants in there, there are certainly disinfection byproducts in there, but the regulators and the public seem to be happy with that. So if you can meet comparable quality to your conventional drinking water, hopefully that sets some floor and says, all right, you're okay. Um, what we did was take 
contaminant concentrations and weight them by metrics of toxic potency because ultimately the toxicity that's delivered to your water is a function of both the concentration of the contaminant and how toxic it is. So what we did was take the individual concentrations of each disinfection byproduct and weight it by the concentration associated with a 50% reduction in growth in a cytotoxicity assay. The cytotoxicity is kind of a broad metric for uh, adverse health impacts. Many different modes of action can reduce cell growth. So we use a library that, that has been developed, at least for disinfection byproducts of concentrations that reduce cell growth. And then we sum them up to explicitly consider the mixture. So we're assuming that risk is additive. We'll come back to that later. But we stack up these toxicity weighted concentrations to look at the overall uh, cumulative health of the water. And so they, uh, the essence is kind of summed up here, where under the current approach, we would have two waters. These are stacked mass-based concentrations of disinfection byproducts. And in this case, we'd say water one is of lower quality than water two. So it has more stuff in it overall. And if we look at individual classes like trihalomethanes, we have levels of trihalomethanes above the regulatory one. So we'd say water one is less safe. What we're proposing is you take each of these concentrations, weight it by a metric of toxic potency, and you jump over to this chart over here. And so what happens is this, the story changes because some of these uh, contaminants that are at lower concentrations have much higher toxic potencies. And so the fact that water two has higher concentrations of the guy in blue here, the halo pseudonitriles, means that overall it is of lower quality than of uh, uh, water one. And so we would say if this were a potable reuse water and this were the conventional drinking water, the potable reuse water has work to do. They should add more treatment to try to bring this bar down in line with the conventional drinking water. So I wanted to give you kind of two examples of how this plays out. We looked at kind of six treatment trains around the world uh, and giving you an example here where we have a conventional drinking water that chlorinates. So if we're going to incorporate potable reuse, it's going to have to merge with that chlorinated water. So that's why chlorination shows up as the final process here. But their advanced treatment train is taking conventional effluent, treating it with ultrafiltration. And then this is a non-RO based treatment train. And they tend to string together multiple treatment processes for a really multiple barrier approach. So ozone, biological activated carbon, ozone again, biological activated carbon, and then chlorinating. And we chlorinated them under consistent conditions. And we sampled this facility four times over the course of a year uh, doing this process. So first we can think about current regulatory approaches. So how do they uh, play out in terms of total organic carbon? Uh, the California regulation, the conventional drinking water is above that lemon. But the potable reuse water is even higher than that limit. So as I mentioned before, ozone biological activated carbon isn't going to get you to the 0.5 milligram per liter level. And so in California, currently, you're not really allowed to pursue this approach. But if we look at uh, conventional disinfection byproducts, trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids, and NDMA, both waters, both the drinking water and the potable reuse water, are well below their regulatory limit. How about if we look at the approach that I was discussing, where we, on the left here, we have drinking water, potable reuse water, and a potable reuse water where we added additional treatment. Uh, here we're showing the conventional approach of raw, straight up concentrations for the different compounds. So we can see that the potable reuse water has more stuff overall than the drinking water, even after additional treatment. Uh, and, and the compounds that dominate on a mass basis are trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids in the yellow. We go to the right and we do the toxic potency weighting. We see that it's a consistent story. There's the potable reuse water is of lower quality than the conventional drinking water, even after additional pilot treatment. But the difference is even more stark, and that's due to uh, the recognition that we're forming a lot more brominated byproducts here and they have higher toxic potencies than we do in the drinking water. But interestingly, the compounds that are contributing to the toxicity are very different here. Trihalomethanes you can't see anymore. Haloacetic acids are very small. The compounds that matter are haloacetonitriles and halogenated aldehydes. Uh, second example, 
is uh, here we're looking at a chloraminated system uh, based on the, the California approach, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, advanced oxidation. And so on the left, what we see is the drinking water has a lot more stuff than the potable reuse water on a mass basis. So again, we have high concentrations of halocytic acids and methanes are dominating on a mass basis. When we switch it over to the uh, toxic potency uh, rated basis, uh, again, the drinking water is of uh, lower quality than the potable reuse water by a significant amount. And again, the relative importance of the compounds change. We don't see the trihalomethanes anymore. Halocytic acids appear to be important. We do see some contribution from uh, nitrosamines, but again, some of the unregulated classes like halocytonitriles end up being dominant. So we, as I mentioned, we did this for six reuse facilities worldwide, where we're comparing uh, reuse effluents to their local conventional drinking water. And one of the things we looked at was just if we sort them by whether we use chlorine or chloramines as our final disinfectant, what we see for the drinking waters and the potable reuse waters is if you use chlorine, the potable reuse waters tend to be of lower quality than the drinking waters. Whereas if you use chloramines, they tend to be of comparable quality, even if they're using ozone and biological activated carbon. Uh, one of the other things we can do with this technique is go through each treatment train and compare, uh, see what each treatment process unit does in terms of improving the quality. And so here's an example where we were looking at ozone biological activated carbon, uh, MFRO, in parallel, the same secondary effluent source. So I showed you this plot before with NDMA, where what we saw was ozone BAC, does a better job of controlling NDMA than MFRO. And so that, under the conventional approach, that might lead us to say we should go the ozone BAC route. How about if we do this with the toxic potency weight? So here's the ozone biological activated carbon. Here's the MFRO. What we see is that the MFRO has much lower total uh, toxicity of the mixture compared to BAC. And again, when we look at what constitutes the toxicity, it's not the nitrosamines, THMs, and HAAs of current interest. It's compounds like halocetamides that are unregulated. So just to kind of sum up, sum up some of the benefits of this new approach, ideally it provides what I call a sound endgame. We're comparing something to something else that we're currently happy with, tap water. We're not worried about every detection being a problem. Uh, otherwise, it, it becomes an unmanageable situation for potable reuse utilities. Every time aspirin or something else is discovered, it's the end of the world. Ideally, it's more defensible. Toxicity in a water really is a function of both concentration and toxic potency. This weighting procedure considers both aspects rather than just one at a time. So current approach looks at trihalomethanes, which occur at high concentrations but have very low toxicity or looks at NDMA that has a very high toxic potency but occurs at low concentrations. What really matters is the combination of the two. And when we look at that, we're often seeing that it's the uh, unregulated compounds, things like halocetonitriles that end up being dominant. It also has benefit of being flexible for utilities. The end game for the utility is to minimize the overall toxicity of the complex mixture not necessarily to get hung up on meeting thousands of individual MCLs for different compounds. So we might say, for example, here, you might have a utility that violates the, the THM limit here, as we can see. Uh, but maybe that doesn't matter in the end game if we can say, well, the toxicity of that water overall is lower. Uh, if, if what you're doing is violating a THM MCL, maybe that's okay if overall uh, your toxicity is lower than uh, your comparison water. It's potentially expandable. We can incorporate additional uh, chemical classes if we have available toxicity data, and that's usually the limiting factor. Uh, we did the study with uh, Shane Snyder, who's at University of Arizona, or uh, now at Singapore, but um, he uh, measured many, many pharmaceuticals, as well as perfluorinated compounds. And we can see that some of these compounds show up 
as concern in the National Research Council report. But again, uh, pharmaceuticals tend to be orders of magnitude away from levels of health concern. But perfluorinates show up as potentially important. So we were able to come up, uh, identify some uh, toxicity levels that were on a comparable basis to what we were using for disinfection byproducts. And when we weighted the concentrations of perfluoro that Shane had measured in these waters by these toxic potency metrics, the importance of perfluoro ended up being orders of magnitude lower than the DVPs. So one of the big assumptions behind that procedure I was discussing before was uh, we assumed by making these stacked bar charts, we're essentially assuming that the toxicity of these different compounds is additive, that there's no synergism or antagonism between their activities. So we wanted to go ahead and test that. And we did that with three drinking waters and five potable reuse waters, where we measured up to 45 different DDPs. And what we did was make mixtures, defined mixtures of these different, uh, of the different DDPs measured in these waters. So in, down here, each of these bars, the left-hand bar is the measured cytotoxicity of that defined mixture uh, measured by bioassay, all the different DDPs together. To the right of it is those same DDPs split out into two piles, regulated in the pink and unregulated in the light blue. And then the third bar is the same split, but everything's calculated. So no actual um, toxicity assay, just individual concentration of DDP weighted by its toxic potency metric. What we see is pretty good agreement throughout. Uh, the median agreement was 10%, which essentially indicates that additivity does apply. Uh, and moreover, if we look at this middle bar, what we see is that the unregulated compounds constitute a much bigger fraction of the cytotoxicity than do the regulated compounds such as T THMs and HAAs. Okay, so just to sum up, uh, like I mentioned before, one of the aspects we need to think about with disinfection byproducts is that we form them during the treatment process. So really the name of the game for DDPs is somewhat different from all the other contaminants where instead of trying to remove compounds that occur in the source water, we're trying to prevent the formation of byproducts by tweaking the, uh, the disinfection process uh, to prevent their formation because we need the disinfectants to control the pathogens. And so it's more of an optimization game rather than an avoidance game. And so I gave you some examples of how we could adjust the treatment process to minimize the formation of particular disinfection byproducts. Uh, next, we were talking about how do we validate new reuse trains with a new regulatory approach instead of focusing on developing individual regulations for thousands of, of individual compounds. That's slow. It ignores mi uh, mixture effects. Uh, and it's kind of hard to pick out which compounds are the most important uh, if we're looking at them uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Instead, we can look at the toxicity of the water on a more holistic basis. And what we found when doing this is MFROAOP actually has qualities that typically exceed that of conventional drinking water. Ozone BAC usually doesn't get to the same level of quality, but you can get to comparable quality to your conventional drinking water, provided chloramines are your final disinfectant. It's usually of lower quality than your conventional drinking water if you're using chlorine. Um, and we can use the same kind of approach to uh, if we have a problem, say your potable reuse water is of lower quality than your conventional drinking water, we can use the toxic weighting procedure to diagnose it and say, all right, well, what happens if we go out and we add an additional treatment process? Uh, how will that bring down the toxicity? Have I gotten to where I, I need to be relative to your conventional drinking water? So this new procedure indicate that uh, Disinfection byproducts tend to be more important than many of our other contaminants, uh, but that our current regulations may be focusing on the wrong compounds. They tend to be focused on compounds that occur at high concentration, like trihalomethanes, that are not very toxic, or compounds that are very toxic, but occur at low concentrations, such as nitrosamine. Uh, 
some of the unregulated compounds like haloacetonitriles have the combination of concentration and toxic potency that may make them more important overall. Uh, so figuring out which compounds matter overall is important because ultimately, whenever we design a treatment process, there are trade-offs. If we go in one direction, we'll reduce the concentrations of certain contaminants, but we'll favor others. And so it's important for us to know which ones matter most to make sure we can choose the uh, right treatment process. And lastly, just wanted to acknowledge some funding agencies and take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitch, for this wonderful talk. I mean